Okay, Acts chapter 2. Let me turn there. I'd like you to stand with me in a moment. Let me get there first. And uh, we're going to read the first, or I'm going to read the first 21 verses. i got to be honest, I missed, I missed the response of reading. And, um, but because of this now, we don't do that only on Wednesday nights. Anyway, no, let's all stand. I'm there. Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 21. You know those moments in history you say, man, that would have been awesome to be there? This is one of those moments right here. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, they, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as the rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. They appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, that they, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. You ought to have that phrase underlined in your Bible, his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And then it mentions all of those names here. I'll kind of skip that and go down to about verse 11. Cretus and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. That's another phrase that's worth highlighting. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth it? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up in the, uh, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Now has that happened yet? The prophecy still, that's a near far prophecy. Not all of this prophecy has been fulfilled. And it came to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. I thank you for this example or prototype that this church here is. And I know we don't pattern everything. Uh, we don't get all of our doctrine from the book of Acts, certainly. But Lord, here was a church that was set afire. Tonight, I just pray one more time that you would set our soul afire, Lord, set our soul afire. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We haven't been getting the sort of awards here to give out, I suppose, that now that we are back in operation, we can get those. I know many of you like reading those sermons that are in there, and they do have a lot of good sermons in the sort. Sheldon Smith had one in there. He's the current editor of the sort of the Lord. And he had, he had a phrase in there. And it said this, if the church catches fire, let it burn. I like that phrase. If the church gets on fire for God, just let it burn. Several years ago now, Bill Hybels did a survey in Chicago. And he went out and he was asking people that used to go to church, how come they no longer go to church? And so they told him, well, church is just... Too churchy. That was a common answer or response that he got. So what he decided to do, along with Rick Warren, if you remember, they decided to take and make churches less churchy. Well, there were several problems that accompanied that, but probably the biggest of all was they had filled all these churches up with lost people and they became almost entertainment centers. But to some degree, you have to think about what he said, Mr. Hybels. A lot of people find church boring, and they find it dull. They go to church, sometimes out of a sense of social obligation, 
or out of a sense of religious duty because they know they're supposed to be here. People sing, now I don't know how it sounds out there, but I've said before, it sounds so good up here, it's awesome. The last song you guys sang this morning was such a blessing, I just shut up and listened. It was terrific. But people, a lot of times, they sing half-heartedly. Some people don't sing at all. And as soon as the clock strikes noon, they want to be out the door. They want to be gone. And boredom has replaced blessing. Many people are not excited about the things of God. People get upset over the smallest of things in churches. Buses, if you can remember back, we used to run buses and bus routes. Well, the DOT inspection had parts to do with that, so we stopped running the buses, and uh, so we run vans now. But in all honesty, we could use more van workers. We aren't running them now. I don't know when we're gonna start those back up again, but I'd like to think it would be soon. But because all the schools in our area, well, not all of them, over this way, none of them are opening over this way, they're all opening on, on some kind of a weird schedule. But anyway, uh, we'd like to get those going, but you know what? It's hard to find bus workers. It's hard to find band workers. Um, and I remember when I first got saved back, back in 1981, and the first ministry I got involved with was the bus ministry. And so we would have bus visitation. Now our church back then was, it, I mean a large crowd wouldn't even be this, this big. But you know on a Saturday morning visitation, for bus visitation, we'd have about 16 people come up. Visitation in a lot of churches has become a joke. Now I know that's not, you don't wanna hear that, but that's the truth. Most churches have stopped it. And some of the pastor friends that I have that are the same stripe, exactly the same stripe as we are. King James Bible, local church, pastor-led church, uh, conservative music and all that stuff. Some of them have even stopped door knocking altogether. Now, I've heard them tell, they've told me that to my own, my, they, I've heard it with my own ears. So I'm like, wow. Most churches, they have no vision, they have no goals, they have no burden, they really don't have any direction. Some can't stay awake, some people, hopefully the pastor can, but some people can't stay awake for the preaching during the Sunday morning preaching time. And you know, all of that, there is something wrong. Many churches no longer have a Sunday evening church service. Even more, uh, they have no Wednesday evening service. Some of those things have, in a lot of churches have become a thing of the past. But I can tell you in the church that we read about in Acts chapter 2, in the early church, you read of a church that was red hot, on fire, Bible believing, Christ honoring, soul winning church. A spiritual fire was lit. And so I'm going to go back to what Dr. Sheldon Smith said. When the church catches fire, let it burn. And I'm going to tell you something. That church burned with fire all the way through the book of Acts. Now I do, I do mention one thing doctrinally here. When it says that there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire in verse 3. That is probably just on the apostles. The apostles that were assembled there. Not on everybody around them. The apostles were doing the preaching and the witness. But the church in Acts, in some ways, is a prototype. It is what should happen in our churches even today. Souls being saved, people getting baptized, people committing their life to Christ, preachers and missionaries being sent out. I, uh, I think people would be excited about getting on a van, bringing young children to Christ, picking them up and bringing them in, going out on a Saturday and doing bus visitation and all of that stuff, and just running those bus van routes and working those van routes and bringing children to, to the church. And here, here these children get saved. But people don't get all excited about that. They're, too, they're more consumed, uh, concerned with their self and with their own things than really reaching sinners for Jesus. Now, I will say something. COVID has hurt most churches. I stopped this past week to visit a couple of pastor friends, and uh, he said probably maybe on a good day we'll have 70% of our church back. I don't think we've even had that close. And uh, he said, I don't think a lot of them are coming back. 
Mrs. Smith sat by our house the other day. She said, I think people are liking new in church in their pajamas while they eat their Twinkies. That's exactly what she said. And uh, no, I got kicked out of that, but she said that. And uh, it's, for a pastor, I gotta be honest, it's so discouraging. It can be so depressing. Because it's like, you know, you work to build the church up, you work to build the church up, and then all of a sudden a, a virus hits and people just, and churches have lost momentum. I mean, about every single pastor that I talk to, their churches have lost momentum. None of them have had 100% of their people, not one, if 100% of their people come back. And most of the pastors I talk to say they probably won't be. The church that we read about in Acts chapter 2 was a dynamic church. What was the distinctive dynamic about that church? You know what it was? You read about it. It was the fire from heaven. The church was set ablaze. We sing that song, set my soul on fire, Lord, set my soul on fire. And this church, in Acts chapter 2, was set on fire. And you know, when the Spirit of God fills Christians with His presence, with the presence of Christ, and with the person and power of the Holy Spirit of God, and the power of God, you know what? That church is going to catch fire. And I want to say a few things about the fire of God. Who sets our soul on fire as we sing it? The Lord does. But you know, I'm going to say a few things here. Fire is sometimes used in the Bible as a symbol to indicate the presence of God. A church on fire is a, indicates that God is present. In Genesis 15, we see it expressed in terms of a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. And then in Exodus chapter 3, you remember where Moses stood before the burning bush and God appeared through that burning bush, burning but not consumed. And in Exodus chapter 9, that was the presence of God. In Exodus chapter 19, it's seen that the whole Mount Sinai was on fire, and it says in Exodus 19, 18, in Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in a fire, and smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. I mean, the fire of God came down, the presence of God. And when the fire burns, smoke will be rising from it. And when the fire of God is burning in me, and when the fire of God is burning in you, the presence of God becomes evident. You'll see the smoke that signals, God, that signals God's presence. Sometimes fire is associated with God working a miracle. In 1 Kings chapter 8, you have that. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, David prayed, prayed, and the Lord answered by fire. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, Solomon prayed and God answered by fire. In Exodus 9, in the context, uh, in a contest rather with the Egyptian pharaohs, the Lord, in support of his blessing upon his servant, set a plague of hail mingled with fire. That is, I mean, that is, you think about it, hail and fire at the same time. You ever see that happen? I've never seen anything like that happen. God displayed himself in a great power to these wicked kings. And then thirdly, sometimes in Numbers 16, 35, God answered Moses with a killing fire. Took the lives of 250 people of his enemy. It says in uh, the Bible, it says in, in Numbers 16, and there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Sometimes God does that. God did that for Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 1. So here God answered by fire in full support of the man of God, the men of God, Elijah, David, and Moses. In the Bible, fire is also an instrument of eternal punishment. In Matthew 18, 8, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut it off, and cast them from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life, uh, halt or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And then in Matthew, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, if you're wondering if I believe in a literal hell, I believe in a literal hell. I'd like to think, I, I'm pretty sure that 100% of you here tonight believe in a literal hell. Look at over at uh, Mark chapter 9. I'll come back to this Acts 2 later. Oh, I'm going to put my ribbon in there. But uh, look at Mark chapter 9. In verse 43. <clears throat> Excuse me. If thy hand defend thee, cut it off. 
It is better for thee to enter into life of maimed than having two hands to go into hell under the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter home into life than having two feet to be cast into hell and to the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye, if the eye, and eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where the worm dieth not, and where the fire is not quenched. By the way, I want to to pluck out your eye is not necessarily a literal thing. There was a young man that I met recently, and he came to my office. And a couple of pastors of like these out there Pentecostal type group, I mean the way out, they told him to do some of that stuff. And you know what? He did. He has severely maimed his body. At the at the council of these pastors. So that you know you don't take all of that stuff literal, obviously. You don't pluck your eye out. Anyway, the rich man said in Luke 16, 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, and may he dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He said, For I am tormented in this flame. And then in Revelation 21, 8, he said, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth, uh, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now listen, it is my goal, and I trust yours, to rescue people from the torments of hell. And a church that is set on fire, or an individual that is set on fire, they make that their life mission. They make that their goal. They want to rescue people from the torments of hell. And then fifthly, sometimes the Bible also says a fire is a symbol of God's power. Now while most have never seen it, do you know it's a sad truth that most people have never really seen the mighty power of God. I would say I saw it, but I was, I mean, and this was a mighty manifestation of God one time in my life. Now, I believe that the presence of God is always, and I think it's a miracle of a miracle anytime a sinner gets saved. No misunderstanding. But when I saw an outpouring of the Spirit of God, things happened. And I mean, they happened. It was just a, just a tremendous thing to see. So that's why I say sometimes, some of you have never seen that. But I will tell you something. It is my prayer. It is my dream. It is my expectation. It is my hope that men and women and children and teenagers and boys and girls burn with the fire of God upon them. I really do. If church is boring to you, even if you're faithful, you need to get a burning of fire that won't be stopped by disappointment or defeated. Uh, in other words, that fire ought not to go out. The manifestation that I mentioned that I saw, uh, the fire there, that one, it didn't go out. The people that were involved in that, they got on fire for God and they stayed on fire for God. The person who makes the fire uh, can fill and empower you is our great God. He's our Father, and He is Almighty God. You don't get the fire until you are possessed by Him who makes the fire, because that's where it comes from. It comes from God. Now, where does it fall? Well, obviously, the fire falls on His people when they are willing to be filled and thrilled with the fire of God's blessings, filling them and penetrating them and empowering them as they live their lives in total surrender. We just sang six verses of I Surrender All. Most hymn books don't even have six verses of I Surrender All in it, to be truthful. We just sang six verses of it. But I wonder if you really have surrendered all. Because we won't see people saved until the fire of God's power comes to bless. And quite frankly, beloved, we need the power of God, and it falls on those who are seeking it. Now, lost people don't seek God. Paul said that in Romans. But... Save people seek after God. Jeremiah told us that. We are to seek Him with all of our heart. I can seek God. You can seek God. You can have your heart filled with the power of God. You can seek after His presence and His power. The whole, look at Isaiah chapter 6. 
But you know what? That is the New Testament model. They were all of one accord. As we stand together on the divine authority of biblical truth, and we let harmony and unity prevail. Now listen, the church is led by a pastor, right? A pastor-led church. The easiest way to create unity in the church is to follow the leadership of the pastor. I don't think I'm Lord over the church in much of anything. Now, I will say this. I didn't consult one person when I, I came down the stairs one day. I hadn't talked to my wife about this. I hadn't talked to the leaders of the church. I hadn't talked to anyone. And I said, I think, I think God wants us to open the church. And she just looked at me. Then we began to make plans to open the church. That's the pastor's decision. A lady asked me one time if we could vote on what kind of music we would use in our church. I said, not as long as I'm the pastor, we're not going to vote on what kind of music we could use in the church. That's the pastor's call. All those things are the pastor's call. But the was wanting to decorate a room, and I got thinking about the same thing. We might even talk about it. Remember when Ashley painted her room, John Deere Green, and yellow? Well, I don't think the colors. Whoever. Usually, the non primary areas are picked by the pastor's wife and her, her pastor together. Listen, I didn't pick that pink auditorium in there. Our previous pastor, a couple of pastors, were picked those pink pews. It wasn't me, all right, just so you know. But it was him. So Ashley had this book. Now listen, I'm an international case guy. I'm not a John Deere guy. <laughs> international case is red. They are. When I went to school, the big farm down the road here, man, these shows, we all went to school together. They had John Deere's. We had internationals. Did you know it was like the guy, the Chevy guy and a Ford guy talking back and forth? Well, I like I don't like Ford, I like Chevy. We we liked international, we liked John Deere. She painted it that color. And I didn't care. I didn't hear anybody complain. I didn't really care, care about that either. This, those things are worth bickering over. Then my late wife, she painted the Sunday school classes. She got that sponge thing going, and uh, she painted one class yellow, and one class was blue, and one class was that pea green. Yeah, I didn't care for the pea green one, but I never said a word. Because if I don't have to paint it, and somebody else does, when I walk in there, I say, it's just perfect. Amen. That way I don't have to do it, it's just wonderful. Amen. So then, Mrs. Gant changed her room once, and I don't know, I, I, everybody seems to change their rooms every once in a while. I don't lord over that stuff. But, when it comes to the spiritual direction of the church, Amen. The, the buck stops with the pastor. Unless it's a biblical, doctrinal issue, leave your differences at home and come together with one accord. And by the way, don't worry about it. You know why we put this kind of floor in this gym? Because it's the one we can find the best deal on. And it's very tough. It's bamboo and it's hot as rock. And uh, but that's, that's, why, you know, that's why we do that. Now listen, the church needs to be sweetly together in one place, unified in one accord. There cannot be sowing discord through gossip, uh, through discouragement, through, what was that word you used? Negativism. There's some people that are just negative. You know, you kind of, kind of, let that go and just go forward. Look at you got bigger fish to fry. People are dying and going to hell about bickering over the littlest things that people can bicker over. The fire of God draws us together. The church, one of the churches in Rome, one of the Baptist churches in Rome, some years ago, and two ladies had a disagreement out in the parking lot, and one slapped the other one right face. Man, I wish I had been there to see that, but anyway, it wasn't. But that's what happened. Now, you think there was a church of one accord? Listen, you're as carnal as I am. You'd like to saw that happen too, by the way. So listen, but those things aren't, that's not a it brought them together in one accord, the fire of God. And then secondly, I want to look at verse 3. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I personally believe, you may not, but I believe the them and the they in verses 3 and 4, I believe that had to do with the apostles. That's my opinion. You can have a different one if you so choose. Uh, gave them utterance, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So, 
the fighter delivers victoriously. Now listen, three miracles are here. The rushing mighty wind that filled the house, the cloven visible tongues of fire, and answer God had gotten their attention with the wind and the physical fire, that would have gotten my attention, that would have gotten your attention. He gives to them supernaturally the ability to speak real known languages. That's what those were. They heard them, every man heard them speak in their own language, in their own tongue. They, listen, they had never studied those languages. Uh, they didn't know those languages. They were all foreign people there. But you know why that happened? So they could hear the gospel. The Greek word for tongue is glossolia, and it means a language. They were known languages. So verse 11 says this. Greeks and Arabians, we do hear them speak in, in our tongues the wonderful works of God. You know why God gave them that ability to do that back in Acts chapter 2? So the great works of God could be given out by the preachers. That's why tongues were given here. God put fire upon those people so that the Jews from at least 17 different language groups, we're told, could hear the message of the gospel and could take it back home from Pentecost and go back and share the gospel. Now let's fast forward to the end of the story. A great victory resulted in 3,000 souls being converted to Jesus. Now that's, that's a good day. And then... The fire of God effects the onlooker. Look at verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. You see that word confounded? They were distressed because they never heard, men, heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? But they did. They all heard it. God stirred. They, you get stirred up for God. And don't let the naysayers discourage you. Don't let them. They listen, you can't let them say, oh, I think you witnessed too much. I was out with a man one day. This was years ago in our church. They moved on. But uh, we, we came up to this house. And we were visiting at this house. And we went there to do something. And I asked, I asked the family this question. Where do you guys go worship? And I don't remember the end, but I remember this. We got in the car on the way back home, and the guy said, don't you think you were a little bit pushy? Now, how many of you think this is a pushy question? Where do you worship? Is that pushy? Now, listen, if you think that's too pushy, you need to catch fire, man, or lady, or boy, or girl. That's not pushy. That's just a question. And I, don't and I like to listen to people go, uh, Respond. I think you need to listen to sinners to hear what they're going to say. But listen, you get stirred up for God. Somebody's going to say, well, I think you witnessed too much. You're too bold. You live too separated. Uh, don't let that bother you. You go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Man, you're going to church too much. I had one of my uh, relatives tell me when I got saved and I started getting on fire for God. They said, you know you're ruining your life. I've heard that right out of my own brother's mouth. Listen. Whatsoever God has for us, we're to do it. We're to do it. It may create some difficulties. Some people won't like it. You might get falsely charged. They got falsely charged. Look what it said in verse 13. Others mocking said these men were full of new wine. You know what they were charged with? They were a little bit bombed. They were drunk. That's what they were charged with. Now, people do that. It just happens. But the resources of God are available so that I and you can do God's work. And then fourthly, the fire of God demands a decision. Look down to verse 21. And it came to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The fire that God gave was a hot fire. It'll warm your heart. It'll give you compassion for sinners and for saints. It's a holy fire. It will clean you and purify you and it will temper you. And it's a heavenly fire. And your agenda will line up with God's agenda and you'll do exactly what God wants you to do. You get concerned with the things that God is concerned with. I fear sometimes we're too concerned with the things God's not concerned with. But that's where our, our energies go. J. 
Jeremiah said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But as the word was in my heart as burning fire, shut up my bones, and I was weary with forbearing. And he said, I could not stay. Jeremiah got so on fire for God, he couldn't help but preach the word of God. The Bible says, and they said one to another in Luke 24, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Speaking of Jesus, the psalmist said, my heart was hot within me while I was using the fire burned, then I spake, uh, then spake I with my tongue. Do you know what we need? We need the fire of God. We really, really need the fire of God. You know that song, Jimmy, I want you to sing this later on before we go home. Uh, Faith wrote the number down earlier. But we need, to, we need the breath of God to breathe on us. I mean, we really do. The fire of God, it's still powerful. It's still necessary. And it's still available. We can't accept the work of God to be declining and dry and dull and defeated and dead like is what's happening in so many churches right now in America. So I appeal to all of us tonight, you know, what's, what, we ought to let the lower lights be burning and let God, we ought to beg God, God, breathe on me the fire of God. Let's ask God to do that. Let's witness uh, like we've never witnessed before so that all can hear. When your heart burns with the fire of God, it keeps you Think of Noah. It keeps you driving nails to build an ark. It keeps you looking for a city whose builder and maker of God. It just keeps you keeping on, keeping on. It, it'll keep you from pressing on to Nineveh even. No matter your preference, no matter what your preference is. It'll just keep you doing the right thing. You won't go there. Perhaps there are many of us who need a fresh anointing with the power of God. Perhaps all of us need a fresh anointing with the power of God. So will you pray? Oh God, tonight, fill me tonight. And would you spend maybe time even at home praying, God, would you fill me with your fire? Would you put a passion in my soul? Would you set my soul to fire? God, would you give me your power tonight? Put the fire within me right now and let your fire burn in my heart. Ask God to do that. Faith, would you slip to the piano? Jim, if you'll get that song. And I'm going to sing that song tonight. Whatever number it is, Faith will tell you. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. We've been preaching on revival for several weeks. I assume, I hope I'm right in assuming this.